Good morning, everyone. If you have kids and you had send your kids to school, or I suspect even if you homeschool, you probably have some kind of chart that tells the kids or reminds the kids the rules of the classroom, or at least the, the fundamental basic rules. April's got one, and I know several other people in here have taught and have had them. I even have one in my college class. Now, it doesn't look like this. <laughs> we understand the idea of kind of needing a simplified set of rules, I think, to help guide us to sort of every day along the way. So I teach community college, and I have history classes and speech classes, and I have a form of this too, and I'm going to tell you about it in a little bit. In a little bit. But the more I have thought about it, and I've honed it over the years, it's, it's not 100% perfect yet, but I've honed it over the years. There's a couple people in here that have been in my classroom, but I think most of you was before I got to this point. It's been a while for Ryan and everyone. So... We, um, I have this, you know, this way of going about things. Now, every college class has this document called a syllabus. Uh, ours are online now, so we don't hand out paper anymore. But all this information is on our uh, online uh, school thing that they use, and they all get into, and all the details are there. But what the syllabus is meant to do is, is in part, explain... Uh, what I, as a teacher, would expect within the classroom. It, it does a number of things, like the expectations of the class. Okay, these are this is what you're going to be doing. The um, the learning objectives and all those sorts of things. Of course, no one ever reads this stuff in the syllabus, right? They get right to the point. They want to know what's due and when is it due. And that's in there. The assignments and due dates and all the sort of nitty gritty, the what I call the mechanical part of the class, all in there. It, it also, though, is going to be a, a, a containing all the kind of other little pieces of information, like basic school policies, like you can't bring explosives to class and stuff like that. That's in there. All right. It tells all of that stuff. It tells you about all the tutoring opportunities we have and all the sort of programs that we have at the college and it just it gives all this information again way more than most people are going to read because most people are concerned in that class about what to do in that class but I've boiled mine down to three simple rules of success that really then translate into kind of all those other things but the more I have thought about it the more I've thought that you know what there's a lot of similarities, I think, between how I've done that and I think what we can do with Scripture. And that's not to say that the details aren't important and that all the rules aren't important, but I think maybe you'll see that if we kind of simplify things in a way that's easily brought to mind, then we are able to connect the dots and say, well, where does this situation fit? Oh, it fits under this idea. And what about this situation? Well, it fits under this other idea, and we have some simple rules. Now, a college class is nowhere near as important as our lives as Christians. Nowhere. But we can learn a great deal about what goes on. So I've got three simple rules for success. And they're, again, pretty simple. They're be here, do your work, and don't bother anybody. All right? That's what I tell my class. So in the college perspective, what does be here mean? Well, it's pretty simple. It means be here, be present. Your presence is required in these classes because they're mainly because there is a lot of information that's going to be given out in these classes or you're going to be doing like speeches, you're going to be giving speeches in the class. So you kind of need to be here in order to succeed. But it's more than that. It's, it's about not missing class, but it's also about, of course, being on time to class and those sorts of things. But really, it's, more, it's even deeper than that. It's about being present and paying attention to what's going on. It's not just about sitting in a chair, because I have students that just do that. And look, it's their choice. You'll see as I go along, there's some leeway here. 
that students have because they are adults and they do get to make the choices they want. Just like you as a child of God, you can choose to do whatever you want and God will allow it. But there will be consequences to the choices that are made. And I treat my students the same way. So it means Thirdly, being here is not just sitting or occupying space or as my old auto shop teacher, you know, just breathing air, used to say. It's about paying attention. It's about participating in the process. Whatever process that is. In history, it's a lot of uh, lecture and then discussion, question and answer. In speech, of course, it's a lot of actually giving speeches and sort of uh, helping critique other people's speeches. You know, whatever is allowed for in that class, you need to be engaged and participating in that, and so on. What does that mean for a Christian? Well, a few things. And the first thing, an obvious thing is, it means our presence is required, right? It means that we need to be present. God has always required the presence of His people. From the very beginning, He has always required. Think about this. What is required in an animal sacrifice? It is a lot of work, and it is a mess, and you have to be there. You participate directly in the process. I know later we'll involve the priests and everything, but you were still right there. You still were part of the process, even as the priests themselves began to offer sacrifices for you and for others. God has always required our presence. It's very personal how God wants us to be. Think about the the Israelites as a whole as they become a nation coming out of Egypt. And God spoke to them through Moses and He laid down all these laws. And in Leviticus 23, we're told all about the different feasts and festivals and celebrations they were supposed to engage in. One being the the Passover, the, the big one. Right? We remember that God saved us from Egypt and so on. And then there's all these other festivals about harvests and different things. And they were required to congregate together in one place to do that. Eventually, Solomon builds the temple. And so everyone's required to go to Jerusalem at least once a year to make that pilgrimage, to be present literally in the house of God or before the house of God. He's always required this of us. And of course, it's no different today. You read Hebrews 10, verse 23. He requires us to assemble together exactly as we're doing now. This is, a, again, a lifestyle that God requires is one that it has to do with us being present with Him and with one another together on a regular basis. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a lot going on in that passage, but it's pretty clear that God requires presence. He requires our uh, being together with each other and with Him. But He doesn't just require our presence with Him, right? And with one another as a group. That's certainly a big part of it, but families are required to be present together, right? There is a presence that is necessary to have a, an effective family unit, and if you would turn to Ephesians 5 with me, we'll read a little bit there. This is really what this passage is about. It's about everyone in the family playing their role, doing their part, sacrificing for the other. This is a passage about love. Ephesians 5, verse 22. And and Paul's making an argument about the church and about the family, and the two are similar. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now unfortunately, people read that and they just stop. And they go, that's terrible, we don't want to do that, that's just, that's unnatural, that's, you know, abusive and whatever. They, they're not reading the context, they're not understanding what's going on. Yes, there is some level of submission here. Husbands, he goes on, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. It's the same way husbands, so he says this is how Christ did it. Christ died for the church so that the church would be presented blameless and spotless. Husbands, that's what you need to do. So again, people want to focus on wives, submit to your husbands. They forget about husbands. You need to die for your wife every single day, right? That's what it's about. Well, he goes on. So in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However... Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. We'll go back to Exodus 20 for that. That it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, and bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That all requires presence. Fathers, mothers, children, presence. And some of that is just being there and doing your job. Some of that is going to be, in today's world, putting the phone down. I mean, everything in between, right? God requires presence. We want to be Christians. We've got to be present with our brothers and sisters, with God, with our families. We also need to be present in the world. We don't get to just separate ourselves from the world, as tempting as that might be sometimes, we, are, we have a responsibility toward those who are outside of God's household as well. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, Jesus spoke here about being salt and light. And so we have to be present there too. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So salt that's not salty is a waste. All right, Christians who aren't salty, you're a waste. You're not doing anything. Then he gives us another idea here. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, and so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we have to be present in all these respects. We have to be around. And sacrificing, and again, getting back to our... Uh, sort of the basic premise, really, of Ephesians 5, but all of this is love. Loving our neighbor, loving our enemy, loving our brethren. And that requires sacrifice. Because it's hard to be present in all these respects as much as possible. Well, we also need to be present in the sense that we're paying attention. right? It's not just enough to be there. That's important. Presence is important. But again, there's a much deeper level to this. It's about being part of the process, paying attention to God, Paying attention to ourselves. And Sebastian read 2 Corinthians 13 already for us in the Lord's Supper. He does this to me every time. Which is fine. Certainly bears repeating passages like this that we do need to examine ourselves. We do need to look at where we've been, what we're doing. And so Paul makes a very important point in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that indeed Jesus is in you, unless you fail to meet the test? I hope you will find out what we have, that we have not failed the test. So, of course, we're paying attention to God, we're listening to God, there's all kinds of passages. Jesus says, the Lord speaks, hear Him, He's always saying, lend me your ears, or give me your ears. And Paul and the others are always saying, go and pay attention to what God has said, what God has written, what we are writing to you, these are, in fact, the words of God. And we need to pay attention to that. You know, it seems foolish to sit in a classroom and just take up space and not actually do what the teacher wants you to do. So I have some high school kids that I'm teaching too. They're in this dual credit thing, this early college high school thing. And they have no clue at all what college is like. They've been in you know, school. And I asked them, has anyone talked to you about this? No. And in my case, they're going in a little earlier than they normally do. And, you know, one of the first things I tell them is, 
turn your stuff in on time. And that we'll get to that. But just do what the teacher wants. Don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate what your teacher wants. Don't fight the system because you don't like whatever. Just do it. Right? Just pay attention. Figure out what it is they want. They're all a little bit different. And then give it to them. That's how you succeed. Let's figure out what God wants. Let's pay attention to what God wants. And then put that into play in our own lives. And so then, we examine ourselves by knowing what God wants and then testing ourselves against that standard. That's what Paul's telling us to do in this chapter. So being here, again, is much more than just occupying a space, a seat, breathing oxygen, right? So that's one side. The be here encompasses all sorts of different things like that. Then we get to the second point. In my class, do your work means several things. It means, yes, literally do your work on time. Turn it in on time. It also means do your own work, right? Don't cheat. Academic dishonesty is always a big problem in schools, and so it's, we kind of harp on it, and we do our best to stamp it out or to prevent it in the first place, but it does happen. So there's a number of reasons. You do your own work, one, because that's actually to your benefit. Cheating is not to your benefit, at least personally, maybe to your benefit on a grade, but also if you get caught, you're done. You're, you're getting out. You do that a couple of times, you won't be coming back to that college, that kind of thing. It has some pretty, you know, big consequences if you're wanting, really wanting to go to college. And so it does mean do your own work, and it also means do what it takes to retain and keep that information going to learn, right? So we can go through the motions and, yeah, kind of do our own work, but not really get it. Again, not really be paying attention, not really be doing the extra work. A lot of people think college is all about the... You know, what is it, about three hours a week that I sit in class? It's not it. It's about all the other hours in the week that you're supposed to be working. You're supposed to be doing uh, the reading and homework and different things. And I know that's not fun to hear, students. Sorry, but that is what it is. That's the process. And so, how much of that effort are you going to put into it? And look, I've been there where I just said, I don't care. And I went through the motions and I, I paid for it. Then I grew up. And then suddenly school was a lot easier when I just did what the teacher wanted and I turned my stuff in on time and I treated it like a job. You know? And I did what I needed to do to retain the information. Now, granted, the information was more important to me as an older person than it was as a 20-year-old, but there it is. That's what it means in college. What does it mean for us as Christians to do our own work? Well, there is work to do, right? We do understand that, I hope, that there is a great deal of work to be done. And I don't have the time to really enumerate much of that, but we'll have a couple of ideas here as we read through some Scripture. So basically it means there is work to be done, and we need to be productive in doing that work. You remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? Right? Right? The, the master hands, he's going on a trip and he hands out five talents and two talents and one talent to these different uh, people. Right? And the five talent guy goes, hey, uh, you know, I did something with it and I got five more. The guy says, great, good job. And the other guy says, hey, you gave me two and I got two more. And the, guy, the master says, great, good job. And the one talent man, right? Verse 24. He also, this is uh, Matthew 25, verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid the talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. You might think, well, you know, that wasn't entirely dumb, right? At least he didn't lose it. The master answered, you wicked and slothful servant, lazy, you didn't do anything. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. And of course he says, bad job. You don't get to enter with these guys, and he takes it away. So the point of that isn't about doubling or anything like that. The point of that whole parable is 
whatever you're given, do something with it. You don't have to be the five talent man. I suspect most of us have more talent than we think, and we could do more than we think we can. Nevertheless, whatever the talents are, whatever God has given us, we'll read another passage about this, we need to be productive with that. Hiding it under a rock, we just read Matthew 5, right? Hiding the light under a basket, it's dumb. It makes no sense, and we actually lose value. Again, if you take your money today and stick it in a mattress, that's kind of dumb because you're losing value. I mean, you can't even really keep it in a bank anymore. You're losing value there. So you've got to do something else more constructive, or you're just losing ground. The Master said you, just, you need to do something. And I just noticed there, it's not about what you accomplish, it's about being productive with what you have. All right? Do not measure yourself against other people, except to the extent to say, hey, I bet I could do that too. Make it a good thing, a positive thing. Don't say, well, that's not me. Or, well, I can't do what Mike can do, so I'm useless. That's not how this works. So we need to be productive. Romans chapter 12 Paul there wrote about using our talents, our abilities. We've, we've done a couple of little classes on this about uh, how we all possess certain characteristics in some measure. And, and Paul's argument here is, if you have these things in some measure, then you should be using them. Read with me Romans 12, beginning in verse 3. Now remember, he starts off by saying, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then he goes into this idea. Verse 3, by grace given to me, I say everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Now, just think about the body illustration. We've heard this before, right? We all have a body. We are, that body is made up of a ton of parts that you never think about. Until you hurt one. Right? When you kick the corner of the bed with your little toe, man. When you hit your thumb with a hammer, man. Right? Do you fall off a skateboard and break your elbow? Man. Let me tell you. Okay? You don't think about these things. And all the other little parts, you don't even know because I'm, you know, I'm not, not a biologist, right? All this stuff working together, but when something's not working, man. That takes a toll on everything. The church is the same way. And it has parts, and there's several passages, of 1 Corinthians 12 is another one that kind of discusses this in context of what they had, their spiritual gifts and things. What Paul's discussing here are like um, ability traits, personality traits. Everybody has these in some measure. Okay, So... Uh, Again, so though we are many, we are one body in Christ, individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, if the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Whichever ones of those you possess in some abundance, you need to be doing those things. You need to be using those things. Now, we, need, we can develop the others too, but we all have different personalities, different strengths and weaknesses, and we need that, and we need to play off of one another with these things. Some people are better at teaching, which is disseminating information to other people, and other people are better at exhorting. That's kind of like cheerleading and getting people motivated. Those are two very different skills. Sometimes they happen in the same person, but not always. And so we need to be using those things, just as an example. And so we need to use our talents, be productive, but here Paul says you need to do well with those things. You need to be, be using them to the measure that God has given to you. And we need to put the time in to understanding what God wants. So again, being here and sort of paying attention to God, they're connected to this idea of doing our own work and working hard to know what's expected. Acts chapter 17, verse 10, Paul's been chased out of town after town by these, um, you know, these Judaizing teachers, right? These intelligent 
educated guys coming behind Paul, teaching everyone that Paul's an idiot and that they need to do things differently. They need to go back to the Old Testament and people are going, yeah, that kind of sounds pretty good. And, and part of it is selfishness. These people are afraid that Paul's going to destroy the system. It's why they killed Jesus. It's why they killed Stephen. It's why they kill a number of these people because they are changing the system. Jesus is changing the system and they don't like it. In Acts 17, we read about this group in Berea. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. These people cared about what Jesus, what God said. And they took what Paul said and they compared it to what they knew God said to make sure that what Paul was saying was right. That's what we have to be like. That's what being here and doing our work really means. Then we get to this third point. Don't bother anybody. Maybe I should twist it and make it a positive statement instead of a negative statement to match the other two, but I really think this captures the essence of <clears throat> one of the things that's important, especially in a class. So in college, what I tell them is, this means that you can't do anything in here that's going to interfere with another student's ability to be here and do their own work, right? So whatever you're doing in here, it can't interfere with the other people in here. And I'll tell them, if you want to sleep, go ahead, but don't snore. You know, again, that's a choice they could make, right? In a college class, it's fine. And sometimes they take advantage of that. There's only one time in 12 years I've had to move somebody out because they were snoring. We've woken a couple people up. One person just kept falling back asleep. And, but she was on some medication and she was already sick. It was several years ago. She left. I, I asked her to leave. But it's like, you want to eat in here? Fine, just make sure you're not making a bunch of noise. You know, that kind of thing, right? You get a bag of chips out of the vending machine, which only works 50% of the time. Uh, you can't be, like, reaching in and out of the bag, making all that crackling sound, right? So, like, instinctively, we understand that. What you're doing can't, shouldn't interfere with the other students. So that's one. Uh, also, part of this is about things like civility and kindness toward the other people in class. I mean, sometimes, especially in history class, we discuss some pretty difficult things. And so, you know, people need to understand that. And they need to treat people with respect. People have different opinions. And we get into political things and sometimes religious things. And, you know, of course, all these uh, things that happened in the past, racism, slavery. I mean, this brings up all sorts of, you know, ideas, right? People have feelings. But we have to be civil and kind to that. People giving speeches, right? That's, that's a harrowing experience for most people. You know that most people, and study after study is done on this, that without fail, every study says the, the one thing that, the number one thing that people are afraid of is public speaking. Death is number two. Always. And so in a class, you have to be understanding, right? So again, it's about not bothering people. It's about treating people with respect. But it also has the positive component of actually, again, participating, like we've talked about already, but being encouraging and encouraging others and helping and being constructive. In a speech class, we do sometimes break things down in the class with everybody there, with they've already done their speeches, and then we talk about it. And it needs to be constructive, right? And these are positive, encouraging things. Or even just giving someone your attention. So there's a lot of overlap here, but the bottom line is you need to be here and doing your work and doing it in such a way that's not going to interfere with everyone else. And it's going to be helpful. I like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the whole chapter here, because that's kind of what Paul's getting at. In several places, Paul's going to say, you Christians need to figure out how to get along with people that are different than you as they come to the Lord. And they have different customs and so on. And so he's going to pick one to illustrate what he means in 1 Corinthians 8. So remember, at this point, we have all these Jews that have become Christians, and then 10 or 15 years go by and Cornelius is baptized and they become Christians. So now the, the church is open to the Gentiles. And so now we're in all these foreign cities 
So here we're in Corinth, and the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, right? This is the Jewish mindset. You're either a Jew or you're not a Jew. So Gentiles, everybody else. And so now the church has got people from all these different cultures sitting in the room together, worshiping together, you know, doing all the things that, that we do. Same stuff that we do, they're doing together, and only they don't know how to deal with it. It's hard. It's, it, a lot of the New Testament deals with this problem of integrating these different cultures, right? Well, he picks this issue of eating food offered to idols, okay? Which a Jew would go, I'm not going to do it. A pagan would go, might go, it's just food. He might go, I'm not doing it either because it reminds me about pagan worship and I don't want any part of that. There's a whole lot of reasons why this might become an issue. And so one Christian might go, you can't eat food sacrificed to idols because it's sacrificed to an idol and that's wrong. Another one might say, well, I just don't like it because you know, I don't want to be part of it. And another one's going to say, hey, it's just food, right? Which is actually the place Paul's going to go, but he wants us to be think, thinking about the other people, right? So, now concerning food offered to idols, this is verse 1. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, but he does not know, as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know. So here he lays down the, the reality. We know that an idol has no real existence. It's a lump of rock or wood or metal, right? Like in real terms, it's nothing. And that there is no God but one. So again, there's not actually another God in play here that you're worshiping, this is nothing. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things, and from whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. In other words, they feel bad, they feel like they're doing something wrong if they eat food that was sacrificed to the goddess Athena. Because they associated it with previous worship, right? Now, Paul's already said, look, it doesn't matter, food is food, but it might matter to someone. That's the point here, right? Don't bother people. We need to be careful about this. Um, well, food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And that's kind of the key here. Yeah, you can eat it, whatever. It's just food. But if there's someone who's really having an issue with it, don't make it an issue. Just don't do it, right? Now, other places he talks about then teaching has to happen, Romans chapter 14 and 15 in particular. Then we teach. And hopefully that person can come out of that. Well, if anyone sees you who have knowledge, that is, knowing that food is food, eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So the idea here is, if I know that... Josh has a problem eating meat sacrificed to idols. I'm not going to go invite him over to go do that. He's not saying never do it. He's saying make sure it's not a stumbling block there. Now, then there's opportunity to discuss and teach, right? So apply this to any number of things that aren't in and of themselves sinful, but might resemble somehow possibly be sinful, or again might be uh, leftovers from cultural or religious things that we come from. That's well, look, brothers and sisters, we need to be careful that we're not putting stumbling blocks in front of one another by the things that we do. We just have to watch ourselves. The right we have needs to be subsumed to the love we have for our brother and sister. And so it becomes dangerous when we exert our rights over loving and sacrifice. Remember Ephesians 5, it's all about sacrifice. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Wives sacrifice to their husbands. Husbands sacrifice for their wives children, so on. Because Jesus did. Same thing here. Paul's making basically the same argument. Because Jesus did, you can too. So, 
we need to be careful that we're not putting a stumbling block. We need to be kind and respectful, of course, to all people. Colossians 3, if you would. Uh, this is a must. We were talking about this Friday night. One of the first characteristics that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, that is, love is kindness. You cannot be a Christian, you cannot be loving without being kind. Simply not possible. And so it is a necessity of every child of God that they be kind and respectful to people, no matter who they are. Colossians 3.12, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And, above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. If you're not kind, you're not a Christian. It's not that's the way it is. And so, it's a must. Again, there's lots of other things we could put in here, right? But, don't bother it, don't bother anybody, actually is, is more positive than what it seems like. And so, we need to be kind and encouraging and respectful. And the third point is about being encouraging. It's not enough to just not be discouraging, right? You read 1 Corinthians 8 and you're like, well, I don't want to put a stumbling block, so there is an element where I'm going to do my best to not be discouraging to someone, but there's the other side, the flip side of that coin, that is we need to be encouraging as often as possible. We already read Hebrews 10, where we're to stir one another up to love and good works. We do that by, again, being present together, but there's a whole host of other ways this could happen. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul wrote to them, a church that was doing pretty well, to look ahead and say, encourage one another. Verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, which is making this idea about night and day, you're asleep at night, you're awake during the day. So since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, because this is true, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Like in class, right, everybody's kind of moving in the same direction in my classes, and they're trying to, we're learning the same stuff, and they're going through the same process, and they're doing their papers and their exams and the discussions, and we're all, they're all going through that together. And it helps if they, you know, not just, Get not get in the way, but if they actually help each other, right? It's a much more rewarding experience. Same for us. We need to be helping one another. So the rules work pretty well for my college classes. They, I think they work overall pretty well. If we want to simplify things, okay, so what do I, what, how should I act? What do I need to be doing? Let's be present, let's do our work, and let's not bother people. And so it is about being faithful. We put these things into practice. Again, you'll, pay, you'll, you'll pass my class. You'll succeed. If you put these things into practice, we will do well as children of God. We won't be without fault. No one is, but we will do well. And so, as always, God's grace remains, right? To fill in the gaps that inevitably appear as we strive to walk godly lives. And so the question is here for us, will you strive to be faithful? And then second to that, will you help me do the same? That's what we want to think about this morning. We're going to sing the song, Before the Throne of God Above. Everything we do, by the way, is before the throne of God above. He sees everything. He knows everything. He has also given us everything. We've talked for the last several weeks about being holy we can get wrapped up in all the little details, which again, are important. I don't want to downplay that. But if we get caught up in the details, we forget about who we really are. Same thing that Jesus got onto the Pharisees for in Matthew 23. He said, you remember, you made it a point to tithe, right? A tenth of all your little spices. Can you imagine going through your spice cabinet and you know, counting the grains of, uh, I don't know what you have, counting the bay leaves will make it like sort of easy, right? But let's say you're counting the salt grains. I mean, they get that ridiculous. I got to make sure I got 10%, but they forgot about loving people and being kind to people and justice. 
That's why sometimes we need to step back and just look at the bigger picture. We're going to sing this song. Perhaps you, being a child of God, have forgotten some of that and need some help or, or uh, need to have some questions, or maybe you're struggling and you need some help. That's okay. That's what we're here for, right? We're all here together trying to encourage one another to get to heaven, to do what God wants us to do. So you have an opportunity, if you want, to come forward and let us know. Ask for prayers. Ask for help. Talk to one of us later. Anybody here, certainly Bobby and I, uh, would love to speak with you if you have any challenges or needs at all. But perhaps some of you are not yet children of God. That is a hugely important step. The first step. Do you believe that He is the Son of God? If the answer is yes, then what are you waiting for? If the answer is no, then let's talk. Let's ask questions and answer questions. So you come, you confess Him as your Savior, you repent of your sins, you're baptized in water, which changes your relationship to Him, and now you walk in this new life. Now you're in the classroom. Be here, do your work, and don't bother anybody, right? That's what it means. We're going to sing this song again. If you need to respond, let us know as we stand.